Amen. Praise the Lord for that. If you would stand, we're going to stand again, stand together, and the choir will be dismissed as we sing this song. And for those uh, children who are planning on being in junior church, you can be dismissed at this time. And for those of children who are planning on being in junior church, you can be dismissed. And we're going to sing again hymn number 200. Hymn number 200, he is a wonderful Savior to me. Hymn number 200. I was lost in sin, but Jesus... singing this morning. You may be seated. So good to have you here at Bible Baptist Church, member and visitor alike. Blessing to be here today. Thank you, young people, for the good music this morning and singing out. I tell you what, it's, it's a lot of fun, even during the congregational hymns, uh, to have a whole choir behind us uh, singing, singing this direction. So I like it. Once they left on that last song, I thought, oh, it's all the en- where'd the energy go? It's gone. It was back to just us up here. So good uh, to be here today. John chapter 10 in your Bibles, John chapter 10, wanted to uh, give a a little extra word perhaps about the uh, announcement regarding men's advance. Men's advance, if uh, you aren't familiar with it, we've only done it one other time here, Uh, but men's advance is a uh, two-day preaching conference uh, specifically geared for men. And uh, you say, well, that sounds a lot like a retreat. Well, it kind of is, but real men don't retreat. They advance. And so, hence the name, uh, the Men's Advance. And so that's coming up April 16th and 17th. And it's going to start off Friday Friday with a, uh, a special shoot. So if you, if you can get off of work Friday earlier in the day around 11 or lunchtime, uh, we'll get you a little more details. But there's going to be a pistol shoot with a contest that goes with that. Also a big uh, 3D archery uh, range that we'll go through. And, um, you know, we already know who's going to win that. But if you want to come anyway just for the fun of it, no, it's going to be Brother Mackey, of course, you know, dead eye. 
And uh, so we're going to have a good time with that. And after that, even if you don't get into the shoot or anything, uh, that Friday evening, April 16th, we're going to start with a catered meal here at the church. And uh, that's at 5.30, I think, on the 16th. And then at 7 o'clock, if you can't come for anything before that, at least come at 7 o'clock, men, uh, for the preaching time. We're going to have two sermons back-to-back that Friday night, uh, one area preacher and one that, uh, our guest preacher that we're flying in for it is Evangelist Bill Prater, uh, was the pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church in Liberal, Kansas for many years, and just recently uh, handed the pastorate of that church to his son, Tyler Prater, and uh, Evangelist Br- Brother Prater, he He's uh, now traveling around, doing meetings, things like this, and so he'll be preaching for us Friday night, as well as then Saturday morning. You can uh, uh, go go home and sleep, or people that are out of town, we're putting them up in a hotel, and then we'll be back Saturday morning, April 17th, for more preaching, uh, two more messages from uh, myself and Pastor Nicholson in Bemidji, and then Brother Prater again, and we'll wrap it all up with lunch, and then we'll be done, and so we're going to pack in a bunch of preaching uh, on that weekend, but I'm, I'm just convinced in these, um, these days that we live, and, and this, this is no slight to the wonderful influence of women in, in society and in church, but boy, if we don't have strong men, everybody feels it. It impacts the family. It impacts our church. It impacts uh, our community that, that men need to know their rightful place scripturally to understand biblical masculinity. We don't want the, the stuff that the world calls toxic mas- masculinity, and I believe there is a toxicity that, that can be there if it goes off of the rails. But masculinity is not a bad thing, men. And it's a biblical thing. I believe Jesus was a manly, masculine man, and yet he was a gentleman, wasn't he? And so there's a biblical balance to all of these things. And uh, what we want to do with this particular event uh, is really to minister to men. And so, guys, you come out, there's no cost to come. In fact, if you want to invite someone to come that may not uh, be comfortable maybe yet coming to a church service, but they would come to an event like this where there's good food and they can shoot guns and uh, hear, hear some good, a good charge from the Word of God, invite them out. Um, I think it'd be a, a great opportunity to do that. So that's coming up April 16th and 17th. I don't talk about it a lot because I think most of us kind of understand what it's all about, uh, but if you're new to it or if you're watching online and you weren't real familiar with it, I wanted to take some time to kind of describe that to you. I'm excited about it this year. John 10. John 10. Would you stand with me as we uh, read the Word of God here together this morning, or rather you follow along and follow as I read from verse 11. <clears throat> John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me. Because I lay down my life. That I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself I have, the, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. I'm looking forward to talking this morning about our one good shepherd. Let's pray. Father, as we come before thee again this morning, Lord, we acknowledge that we need you. We need your help to worship as we should to lift up our voices and sing like we should with a heart that is right, to worship in spirit and in truth. We need your help this morning, Lord. I I need it to preach this passage. And Lord, your people need it 
to be able to hearken to it, to hear it with, without distraction, to process it and to give good heed to it because it is, in fact, the Word of God. And so, Father, we, we are needy people. And we ask that you would work among us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> Apparently, David never told his father and mother what happened that day out in the field. He was just a teenager at the time, and he didn't want to frighten his parents. Long before God even anointed David to be the king and shepherd over the flock of Israel, David was appointed to watch over his father's sheep. It was generally good work for a young man. His older brothers had probably each taken their turn, and then as they grew up, they sort of grew out of that role and uh, t started taking different trades and things like that. So while they were, they, his older brothers, are out uh, at battle and they're following King Saul as soldiers, David is out in the field and he is contentedly watching over his father's sheep. David was a tender young man. He loved the sheep. He had named them all. Uh, he tended to them, bound up their wounds. He had led them to the best pastures that he could find. Those sheep, he didn't regard them as just his chore as the youngest kid. They weren't just a job to him. They were almost like his friends, right? They were his confidants. You'd have thought he was crazy talking to sheep out there in the field. He talked with them like they were people, singing songs for them and playing his harp for the sheep. We get to take advantage of the Psalms today, but the first audience were sheep. He slept out under the stars with the flock. One day, though, David heard a growl, saw a golden flash of fur at the edge of the woods. A lion lunged out, and the sheep scattered in a hundred different directions. A young, slow little lamb wasn't able to keep up with the rest of the flock, and it, and it fell behind. It was no match for the lion. I mean, the, the king of the beasts is after it, and on its tail, and, and, and it, it took this helpless prey in its jaws, about to crush the life out of its little neck, when the lion felt something grabbing its neck. Little scrappy David didn't run from the lion. Instead, he came up behind it and grabbed its bearded mane and, and brought it to the ground with one violent twist. He snapped that neck. The lamb fell out of the lion's mouth onto the ground, and the lion collapsed into this lifeless heap. On a separate occasion, the same thing happened, except with a bear. I don't know if it was the same lamb, but this lamb's days are numbered, you know? It needs to learn how to run a little faster. But with David around, it, it was still safe. The, the bear discovered too late it had messed with the wrong sheep. Or rather, it had messed with the wrong shepherd. A lesser man would have run for his life, right? Including me, right? Uh, the, a lion, a bear. I've hunted bear before, but not with my bare hands. Right? I had a rifle slung over my shoulder, and uh, David had a stick, a sling, and his hands. That's it. When I read the story of David, who risked his life to protect his father's sheep, I am amazed. I don't, I, I can't, uh, I've never been that kind of a shepherd. I don't understand the love and that sort of responsibility to a, a bunch of animals like that. But David's attitude was, look, these are my father's sheep. I've been assigned here. I, I'm not going home and looking my dad in the eye and telling him that some beast got one of his sheep. I'll go home with all of them or not at all. His attitude was, if my father appointed me here, it means God's put me here. No one else is going to guard these sheep. This is my responsibility. And little did David know that God was using that time to prepare him, right? Right? He was, he was helping David to grow and learn how to fight bigger predators like Goliath and, and how to lead bigger flocks like the kingdom of Israel. 
And this instance in the young life of David gives us a wonderful insight and picture into how Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. We learned last time that Jesus is the door, that he came in as Messiah through the proper means. He fulfilled every requirement and law and prophecy that had been laid down in Scripture. John the Baptist, the forerunner sent from God, had pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was expected. He was announced. He came in the right way. He was the one that Israel was waiting for. He wasn't like those thieves we talked about that climb up a different way as those uh, ones that pretended to be shepherds. No, he was the true shepherd. He didn't come to destroy the sheep or use the sheep for his own benefit. He came to give them life and to give it more abundantly. This passage refers to false shepherds like the Pharisees were as hirelings, hirelings. He, we saw how that they treated this uh, man that had been born blind, and Jesus came along and healed that man, but happened to be on the Sabbath day. And so they weren't happy that he got healed. They weren't happy that he found help from Jesus, and they cast him out of the synagogue. They said, you no longer have any part in us because they only cared about maintaining their grip of power. And, and the riches that the people could give them. See, being a religious leader to the Pharisees and their ilk was not about help, helping people. It, it was about helping themselves on the backs of the people. Look what Jesus said in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd... Whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. See, a hireling, he was only there for one job, right? He was just, he was just a hired hand. This wasn't his flock. These sheep meant very little to him. It was, a, it was a paycheck, right? It was a way to get some money, maybe a seasonal job or something, some kid uh, that said, sure, I'll watch the sheep. But th to, to the hireling, these sheep aren't worth dying for. Uh, all, all he wants out of this shepherding deal is the paycheck. And so he's not really a shepherd. He's a hireling. Would you turn with me, um, keep your place in John, I'm sure we'll be back here, but we're going to turn back to the Old Testament prophet of Ezekiel. So I'll give you a minute to try to find that, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, um, then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. The little kids could probably find it quicker than us, right? They've got these books memorized. Ezekiel and chapter 34. <clears throat> Israel had long been ruled by selfish and cruel leaders who claimed to be spiritual shepherds, but were actually these kinds of hirelings. They were thieves among the sheep. We're in Ezekiel 34 where the Lord is pronouncing judgment upon these false shepherds. And by seeing what a bad shepherd looks like, and he describes them here, what it does is it, it contrasts and it gives us a greater appreciation for who our good shepherd is and what he does for us. If you are there in Ezekiel 34, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. Now that is supposed to be the primary job of a shepherd. To feed the flock, 
to find pasture and prepare that pasture for them and, and lead them to it safely so that they can graze and feed and grow as sheep. Now, these shepherds, he says, you're all about what the flock can give you. You want the wool from the flock. You want the meat and the fat from the flock. You'll kill and eat the flock. But you're not feeding the flock. They wanted all the perks of being a shepherd, but without the care of the sheep. Look at verse 4. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, Neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. You know, sometimes sheep get sick. Sometimes sheep get hurt out in the field. And a good shepherd would tend to those needs and help them to heal. But these false shepherds, see, they had no time to to deal with all of that. They had no time to give them that sort of attention. They were only interested in what the sheep could produce, right? And if the sheep weren't producing, if they were sick, if they were hurting, they had very little use for a sheep like that, and they would just cast them out. When one thoughtlessly wandered astray, as sheep tend to do, or was driven off by something that startled it. The false shepherds didn't take the time to go after it because they didn't really care. It's just one. What happens when the the shepherds fail to actually shepherd the flock is that the sheep scatter. They're driven by fear and by hurt and hunger. And eventually the flock is no more. It all scatters. Verse 5. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And none did search or seek after them. You know, God hates that. He hates it when those who are in leadership oppress and abuse those who are under them. Abuse the flock. He promises to hold them accountable in verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. Just like Israel had. Way back in the days of Ezekiel, there are still bad shepherds. There are still bad shepherds. We see it all the time in politics. I mean, where, where are the selfless statesmen of yesteryear, the George Washingtons and the Abraham Lincolns? Uh, do, do they even exist anymore? I don't know. It, it seems like people that rise to levels of leadership and power are almost always there for what's in it for them. It's what they can reap, the power, the riches, rather than serving the people that are under them. Even more tragically, these bad, fake shepherds, these wolves in sheep's clothing, aren't just out there in the secular world, right? Much like Israel, they were, they were also in positions of spiritual leadership in, in many churches. They're rampant among what I would consider to be false churches, right? They're, they're preying upon unsuspecting religious people who, who have a heart to try to do something right and try to follow God, but they're keeping them trapped in a religious system that maintains their power and, and their, their control. I think about how many are out there that are, that are teaching falsehoods, promising people false hope against what's in the word of God while continuing to just enrich themselves on the backs of poor lost sheep. How many of these you know, slimy prosperity preachers are out there? Send me your money and when you do that, God will bless your life with all of this health and wealth and he'll help you uh, fulfill all of your goals and what dreams do you have what do you want in life god will do it all for you just send us your money right show us your faith that way they eat the fat 
They clothe themselves with the wool, but they don't feed the sheep. These TV preachers, they're not there to offer comfort or healing. They won't seek after you when you make a wrong turn in life and are struggling to find your way back. It's just a business model to them. It's just a way to make a luxurious living. What are they? They're hirelings, Jesus said. They're thieves. The Lord is against them. And you know, there are, there are sometimes even bad shepherds among good churches. Now, I've never met a perfect pastor. When you find him, let me know, because I want to be a member underneath him. Unfortunately, we pastors are also broken sinners trying to grow in grace like, like everybody else, right? Every pastor is a work in progress. But there are some who are truly men of goodwill, who, who want to be a good shepherd like Jesus. And sadly, there are others that rule, like he says here, with force and with cruelty, who really have no time for the hurting, that, that uh, don't want to go look after the wandering, whether they are being intentionally cruel or not, you can tell who they are because they always leave behind them a confused and a scattered flock, and a, a flock of unhealthy and fearful and spiritually emaciated sheep. But there's good news. Because even though there are men who have given shepherds a bad name, there is a good shepherd, one who truly loves and cares for us poor sheep. Look at uh, verse 11, and look at what God promises to do here. And I want to encourage you as you're reading this, not to think about what he would do for Israel, but what he promised he'd do for you as one of his sheep. Verse 11, for thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Drop down to verse 14. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And then just such a wonderful prophecy and promise here, verse 23, Ezekiel 34, 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my shepherd... And my servant, David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now, he said, a shepherd is coming for my people. One shepherd over them all. When this prophecy was given, David was already ancient history uh, to Ezekiel and to the people of his day. But everyone knew that David had been a man after God's own heart. He was the ideal shepherd king. Uh, over, over Israel. And this one shepherd that would come would be one who shared that same heart of David to be a good shepherd, to be one who was from David's seed. And when the, time, when the time was right, God sent forth his son into this world to be that good shepherd. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come, to seek and to save that which was lost. That's, a, that's the attitude of a shepherd. That's one who would leave the 90 and 9 in the safety of the fold, and who would leave the, the comforts and the security of home and go and search through the wilderness to find one, because one was precious to him. I am that one who was lost. If you're saved, you were that one. He, he didn't look upon us as an inconvenience when we were lost. He didn't get annoyed when we've been hurt 
and needed his help. He's never abandoned us. He'll never do so because he is the good shepherd. I love it. Turn back to John 10. We're done in Ezekiel for now. John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Again in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, if you've had a bad shepherd in your life, know this morning, God isn't like that. He hates that. He is against such shepherds. If you had a parent who mistreated you, who was selfish, who was cruel, don't look at God that way. That's not how he is. If you had a pastor or a spiritual leader who led you wrong, who didn't have time for you, who didn't care, realize the Lord Jesus is not like that. He loves you unconditionally. Isn't that a wonderful word? Not for what you might be or what you might do for him, but right now, just as you are today, he loves you. When we take a wrong turn, He keeps pursuing us to bring us back because he loves us. When you're not uh, producing as you should be, when you're not serving at a certain capacity, obviously there might be a problem there. That is a red flag in the life of a Christian because we have been called unto good works. But if you're not producing or living up to a certain standard, realize it never affects his love for you. It never once changes his acceptance of you as one of his sheep. When you have been hurt and it's taking a while to heal, he's okay with that. He is a patient and good shepherd who knows exactly what you need. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Isn't that comforting? He knows all there is to know about you. You don't have to pretend uh, to be a certain kind of Christian around him. He says, I know you. I know you. I know what you're going through. I know your weaknesses. I know your struggles. I know your temptations. He knows your fears and your dreams, and he is always with you. As the good shepherd like David, he is ever watchful of anything that would harm his flock. The Bible teaches us that Satan is like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, sin and the devil, they're on a rampage to slaughter God's sheep. And to stop that slaughter, he put himself in harm's way like a shepherd does. He laid down his life as a substitute for us. The end of verse 15 I lay down my life for the sheep. He said he had come to give us life, right? To give it more abundantly. But that life doesn't come cheap. That life he came to give wasn't free. There was a payment to be made. And he paid it. It came at the cost of his life. And he died so that we might live. Verse 17 says, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. You sense that same heart that was in David? It said, my Father gave me a job to do, and he's equipped me to do it. And Jesus Christ looked upon us as those whom his father said, go save my sheep. And he did. He didn't go to the cross because he was forced there. He went because his father had told him to do it. And because he willingly wanted to do it. He took the responsibility personally. He laid down his life voluntarily so that we could live. And so because of that sacrifice, because he died on the cross and he shed his blood on the cross, sin's appetite for blood was satisfied. The final payment was made. 
And all that is waiting now is for that payment that he has already made to be applied to your account. When Jesus spoke these words in John 10, he he already knew, of course, the future. He, he is God, right? He is omniscient and knows all things. He knew exactly what was coming. And, and so these were not hollow words that he was speaking that, oh, yeah, I'll lay down my life for you. Oh, Peter had some of those hollow words, right? I'll, I'll, I'll die for you, Jesus. And he didn't. He ran. But Christ's words were not just empty promises. He knew the cross was coming. He knew who he was going to the cross for, not just his apostles and not even just Israel. He saw us. He saw you. He saw me as lost sheep who needed him as a shepherd. Look at verse 16. He told his disciples, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I wonder if the disciples kind of scratched their head. It didn't, it didn't all sink in right away for them, right? They, they could be kind of dense at times. And so when he's saying, I have other sheep too, they're probably like, who? Who else needs to join us? And he said, they're not even of this fold. They're not even, they're, there are sheep that are mine that are beyond even the fold of Israel. And I'm going to bring them in too. Who's he thinking about? He's thinking about you. He's thinking about me. He's thinking about the, the, the host of billions of unborn people beyond the, the flock of Israel, among the Gentiles, people that had never yet been born and still have yet to be born in history. And he knew and knows them all. And he looked out at all the nations of the Gentiles and he knew there would be some sheep out there who would hear his voice and would follow him and he thought of all those he must reconcile to God. I'm so glad we have a shepherd like him. I want to ask you a couple questions this morning based on the Lord as our one good shepherd. First question is this. Are you one of his sheep? Are you one of his sheep? And by that I mean, have you ever been saved? Have you ever been born again? Because he gave his life in order to save you. It wasn't just a gesture it was, a, it was something that you needed. He, he, he is called out through his word and through the convicting of the Holy Spirit of God. If you're, if you're here this morning and you're thinking, I, I don't know if I'm saved. I, I don't think I've ever done that. I've never prayed and asked Jesus to wash away my sins. I've never repented of, of, of all of that and, and followed him. No, he's giving you his voice, right? What's his voice? It's not some weird, you know, thing that you're going to hear in the middle of the night or out in the middle of a field, this booming voice coming down. That's not what he means by uh, they will hear my voice and follow me. That voice happens on the inside, my friend. It's, it's when the word of God is being opened to you and, and being spoken to you. And deep down inside, there's something that's telling you this is true. This is right. It's, it's convincing you. It's convicting you. But you need to do something with this. This is his voice. And when you hear his voice, he says to follow him. And he'll bring you into his fold. And he'll be your shepherd. And until you are saved, you can never know the full meaning of that wonderful phrase in Psalm 23, that the Lord is my shepherd. If you're not saved, you're still lost. That's the way the Bible puts it. You're still lost out in the wilderness of sin. And, and see, Jesus has made a way for you to join into his fold. He said, I am the door. I am the door. Uh, verse 9, if by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Turn to Christ. Believe on him. And you'll find this abundant life that, be, that is part of being in the family of God. There's only two categories of people in the whole world. There are those who are saved and those who are lost. And every one of us that was saved also was lost. We're not, we're not one kind of people because we're superior and we got it all figured out and we're all put together. No, it's just the grace of God, and the same grace that makes us what we are can make you one of his fold as well. 
Are you one of his sheep? Secondly, are you a part of a flock? Are you a part of a flock? You might be a part of Christ's fold, all of his sheep, and yet not part of a flock that is a local church. If you're saved, you're one of his. But the Lord designed the needs of us sheep to be met in the context of a local flock because there's accountability and there's help and there is protection in a flock. If a, uh, if a little puppy showed up at my doorstep and it was hungry, uh, I might give it some food to eat. Now, I'm specific that it, it's a, a puppy and a, not a kitten. Don't ever feed a cat. It'll, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Miss Brother Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, if a puppy came and it, and it needed a drink or it needed something to eat, I might feed it. But you understand that's not the same thing as it being my dog, right? If it had a bite to eat and then it wandered off, I wouldn't go searching for it. I wouldn't put up missing dog posters throughout the neighborhood with reward for anyone who can help me find it. He came to my door, so I fed it, but he's not mine, and so I, I'm not going to hold it accountable to obey me or stay where I tell it to stay. But if, if it's our dog, right, we, we've purchased this dog, we've adopted this dog into our family, that's a different story. Not only do I feed that puppy, I also care for it, right? If, it's, if it has a, 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 some need, I mean, we've got to take care of it. We've got to take it to the vet. We've got to groom this thing. We've got to bathe it. We, we'll even train it, right? Train your dogs, people, right? Train, train it. Discipline it when it needs it. And if our dog wandered off, man, we wouldn't stop searching for it until it was found because he's part of our family. And that's, he's, that's where he's cared for, right? That's, there's that help and the protection and accountability that is there. And so I want to challenge you as, as a Christian, don't, don't just hang around a flock, become a part of a flock. Do what it takes to be in. God has seen fit in this New Testament age to work in and through local churches. That's how we minister. We talked about ministry this morning in Sunday school. It's how God has, uh, ministers to us and helps us and meets our spiritual needs as sheep. You need to be a part of a flock. If you're not, let's talk about it. Say, I'm interested. Interested. How does a person join? Number three, are you shepherdable? That's a, you heard it first here. Oxford Dictionary will try to put it in next year, I'm sure. Are you shepherdable? The Lord often uses the analogy of sheep in the Bible to teach us about ourselves. And maybe there's a part of you that doesn't like that, right? Uh, it's kind of a, it has a negative connotation to it because sheep are kind of dumb. They're, they're, they're not um, noble creatures. They're not fearsome or independent. They're pretty needy. Uh, they are helpless. They are jittery and fearful. We don't like that image of ourselves, you know. I say, I want to be the stallion, right? I want to be the, the lion or I want to be the, the wolf. No, you're not. You're a sheep. So is me, right? I am too. The problem is that when sheep won't let the shepherd shepherd them, they don't think they need to be shepherded. Sheep get into trouble really fast. The healthiest, safest, happiest sheep are the ones that have the closest relationship to the shepherd. To be shepherd means you've got to be willing to be led, right? I mean, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Meaning I, I have no lack, he takes care of all of my needs. But how does he accomplish that? How does he provide and care for us so well? Through his leadership. By leading and following where he leads. It's, it goes on to say, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Meaning sometimes I wouldn't if he didn't make me. He maketh me to lie down. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen, there are plenty of people that, that are fine claiming that the Lord is their shepherd, but they're not following him. You must be willing. To be led, you have to be humble and recognize as a sheep, 
I need that. I need him in my life. To be shepherded, you've got to be willing to be fed. God promised that he would feed his people. The big problem with the false shepherds is they weren't doing that. They weren't feeding the flock like they were supposed to. But listen, shepherds, even the best of shepherds, don't force feed their sheep, right? All they can do is lead them to pasture. And then it's kind of up to the sheep to bend down and graze and, and take some of it in. You've heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Same with sheep. Same with people. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Also Psalm 23. Table, the table is spread, but you've got to be willing to actually eat what he gives you. Recently, I came across a quote from Pastor Doss. that said, where he leads me, I will follow, and what he feeds me, I will swallow. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes the truth can be a little bit painful or difficult to hear, but even when it feels a little painful, the truth will never harm you. It will never harm you. The sharp two-edged sword of the word of God, it only cuts in order to heal. It is a scalpel in the steady hand of our great physician. And if it's so, just know this. If it is Bible truth, it's good for you. It's good for you. Take it in. Don't turn your nose up at what God feeds you, like, like some spoiled child that will only eat sweets. You ever run across a kid like that? Oh, meat? I only eat chocolate. Right? Do you have any cotton candy in the house? No, but yet, spiritually, are you following? Do you see the announcement? Spiritually, there's a whole host of people that religious, they want to say, the Lord is my shepherd, but they're only willing to eat the sweet stuff. They're not willing to feed on the nourishing truth that is sometimes a little more difficult to take in. Be willing to be fed. Eat up. Grow strong. To be shepherded, you have to be willing to be helped. We all want to be the perfect sheep, right? If I have to be a sheep, at least I, could be, I need to be the perfect sheep. And uh, I want to be the healthy one, I want to have the nice, shiny, clean wool, uh, always close to the shepherd, never wander. That's not reality, because that's not sheep. The fact is we all need help from time to time, because we are sheep. Psalm 23 says, he restoreth my soul. It, it refers to a sheep that has laid down, and the weight of the wool has, has rolled it kind of on its back, and it can't get itself turned right again. And the shepherd will come and he'll restore him. He'll set him back up the way that he is supposed to be. And how often that we get flipped over the wrong way sometimes, our thoughts and our emotions can get all out of whack and we can't right ourselves and we need some help. There are times we get hurt and we can't, just can't seem to, to bandage ourselves up or get better on our own. And it's frustrating because there's a part of us that says, I ought to be able to figure this out on my own. I know enough of the Bible that I, I should be getting better. I should know the answers to all of this. Why can't I take care of this? No, listen, this is normal. This is normal. We need shepherds because we can't fix ourselves you don't, you don't, hopefully you don't go uh, get, get yourself hurt. You need surgery or you need stitches on your back or something. You say, no problem. Don't you take me to the doctor. I know how to do stitches. Well, just get me a mirror <laughs> and you're going to stitch up yourself. You know, isn't this how we are spiritually though? We think I should know how to do this. I, I don't need any help. Don't tell anybody that I've got this gash on my back and I'm struggling with this. no. A shepherd is there to help. Remember how the Lord rebuked the bad shepherds. He said, the diseased have ye not strengthened. Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. This is the role of a shepherd. My observation is that um, as far as our church is concerned, that most do a pretty good job being willing to uh, be led and being willing to be fed 
Um, you have an appetite for the Word of God. You don't typically get offended by the truth, even the hard parts. You, you try to be submissive to authority and leadership God puts in your life. But maybe right here, maybe this is an aspect where we can all, as sheep, we can grow a little bit and we can examine our own lives to be willing to ask for help, to be humble enough to admit when you're struggling. Listen, you are not a failure because you can't seem to fix yourself up and get better all by yourself. This is why God gave you a shepherd. This is why he is a good shepherd unto you. There, there is no such thing as the perfect sheep. There's not. It, it really, when you boil it down and you bring people into a church body and congregation, there's only three kinds of people. I just said before, there's two categories of people. So, yeah separated all in your mind, was lost and saved. But as far as people are concerned, there are people that are broken and trying to get the help that they need in the church. There are people who were broken and got some help. They're trying to help somebody else. And there are those who are broken but are pretending that everything is okay. We all need the Lord to shepherd us. No good comes by trying to maintain a fake, airbrushed image of yourself before others, like everything's fine, but you actually need some healing. So let's be shepherdable. Be shepherdable sheep. We've talked a lot about oneness and unity this year, and you know what? It, it contributes to this oneness when we remember that we were all outside at one point. We were all outside of Christ. And we all had to come through the same door. We all had to come through him. It helps us uh, reduce our pride and uh, uh, care for one another when we realize we're all just dumb sheep. That none of us has got it all put together. We're not perfect. We, we have a shepherd, a perfect, wonderful shepherd in the Lord Jesus Christ who knows us inside and out and loves us just the same. And he's got this true heart like David. He laid down his life for us. And he says there is one door, just one. There's only one way to get saved, and that's Jesus. There is one fold, only God's family, only through that door. And he says there is one shepherd. And I sure hope this morning that you are one of his sheep. If not, I hope you will listen to that inward voice today, that convicting of his spirit, and follow him because he already loves you. You don't have to get it all fixed up. You don't have to get cleaned up. You, you don't have to start saying, once I get my life put back together, then maybe I'll follow Jesus. No, he wants you right now, the way you are, just bumps and bruises and cuts and dirt and sin. He, just come as you are. He wants you today. He loves you more than you can imagine. And once you do, I'm telling you, everything you need, everything is a sheep you'll find in him. Because when the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. All the needs are met in Christ. Let's stand.